Welcome to the Allergy and Asthma Network's 2016 webinar series. We have chosen the title Advances in Allergy and Asthma as we strive to bring you information on clinical issues, current treatment trends, and meaningful information on the daily management of issues related to allergies and asthma. My name is Sally Schessler. I'm the Network's Director of Education. This month, we're addressing latex allergy concerns. Each month, we bring you nationally respected speakers to talk about issues that are important to you. Please plan to join us for each webinar in our series. For this webinar, we are presenting Overcoming Barriers in the Real World, a look at clinical issues, school concerns, and living with latex allergy. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Sandra Gopchek is Clinical Associate of Pediatrics at Thomas Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and Co-Director of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at Crozer Chester Medical Center in Upland, Pennsylvania. She is also President of Asthma and Allergy Research Associates in Upland. She is board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics, American College of Osteopathic Pediatricians, and the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. Dr. Gotchek is a member of many professional organizations, including the Pennsylvania Asthma and Allergy Association and the Philadelphia Allergy Society. She is also past president of both organizations. In addition, she has been a member of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology since 1983 and has served on the Public Relations Committee, Women's Committee, and as chairman of the Committee for the Elderly. Dr. Gotchek is also a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, where she served on the Board of Directors from 2005 to 2009. Dr. Gotchek has had extensive experience doing television, radio, and videos for marketing purposes. She's worked with MedStart Studio doing TV allergy videos, which were broadcast throughout the United States. She has also worked with various public relations firms and has been interviewed by numerous popular publications, such as Vogue, Glamour, Prevention, Reader's Digest, Newsweek, and Bergen Health and Family. Our next panelist will be Patricia Byerwaltis, a pediatric nurse practitioner with 30 years of experience. She worked in pediatric neurology for 15 years prior to moving to spina bifida and spinal cord injury population. She provided direct care, coordinated care, and led a weekly multidisciplinary care conference for that specialized patient population. Peer-to-peer -peer support and annual conferences were organized under her direction for families, including the children. Dr. Bayer Waltis was co-investigator for the Spina Bifida Clinic Grant to become part of the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry, something she advocates for in spinal cord injury as well. She has participated as site coordinator or co-investigator on eight multi-centered drug trials, including those treating conditions secondary to spina bifida and spinal cord injury, such as neurogenic bladder. He is currently chairing a national group developing a care bundle for breast practice related to specific aspects of spina bifida care. He is also co-chairing the initiative to revise the health care guidelines for spina bifida, including overseeing the latex allergy guidelines. She is currently teaching at Minnesota State University, Mankato, passing on her passion for care, undergrad and graduate nursing students. I will complete the panel this evening. As Director of Education for the Allergy and Asthma Network, I oversee our programs, resources, and educational initiatives. I have a strong background in school nursing, previously serving as the Executive Director of the New York Statewide School Health Services Center and as Director of Education for the National Association of School Nurses. At this time, we're going to turn the program over to Dr. Gotchek. We're so pleased you're with us today. Uh, thank you very much, Sally. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, these are my disclosures. I want to say good evening to everybody. Um, uh, what we're going to talk about today is an allergy overview of latex. And we're going to cover a couple of items here, history, latex symptoms, uh, diagnosis and treatment. Now, latex that is used commercially and is commercially available in the United States is available from the rubber tree, Heva brasiliensis, is one of the many worldwide lactiferous plants. There are over 2,000, which include poinsettia and castor beans. The lactiferous plants are unique in that they contain cells that secrete a milky substance, latex. Latex circulates in branch tubes throughout the plant tissue and forms a clog, a clot 
and that heals on the surface of the plant when the plant is cut. This is similar to the way the blood clots. Now, latex was first used as early as 1600 BC, and archaeologists were able to carbon date rubber balls and rubber hafted tools that, tools that were found in Mesoamerica. Now, this particular shot slide shows that latex comes from the latex plant, Hueva brasiliensis, and most of these trees are tapped in Malaysia, Syria, Thailand, and India. And you can see there's a cup or a bowl where the bark is tapped and various chemicals are added to this bowl. Carbonates, thiorans, mercaptive benzothiazole, thiodiamines, which will become important later, as well as ammonia. Now, our next slide. Doc, Dr. Gotchuk, are you using a telephone this evening? No. Okay, it, we're having just a little trouble hearing you. So if you could either sit just a little closer to the computer or if you're on a phone, make sure it's not on speaker. Thank you. Okay, I'm right here. Can you hear me better now? This is better. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next slide looks at there are over 200 proteins that are involved in the, in, um, the latex plant. Of uh, these over 200 proteins, there are 15 which basically can cause IgE sensitization. If you look at this particular slide, HEV-B1 and HEV-B3 are the ones that commonly sensitize patients who have spina bifida. You need mucosal contact with these. These are not airborne. HEV-B5 through HEV-B7 are the ones we commonly find in healthcare workers, and HEV-B8 and HEV-B12 are the profiles and lipid transfer factors that are found in the cross-reactive foods. Our next slide. Our next slide talks about the prevalence of latex allergy. When we evaluate prevalence of latex allergy, we have to look at the group that studied. In the United States, there are 3 million people who suffer from latex allergy, and that's about 1% of the general population. There are 15 million people worldwide who suffer from latex allergy. In spina bifida patients, up until the 2000, there were 37 to 68% of patients who had spina bifida who had latex allergy. When precautions were instituted where latex gloves were avoided in these cases, the incidence dropped to 1%. In Singapore and in third world countries where latex gloves are still being utilized, 46% of patients who have spina bifida basically are still reacting. Healthcare workers account for 8 to 17% of patients, but in recent years this has dropped to 4 to 7%. In, in other areas, rubber industry workers, 11% are latex allergic. In atopic patients, 6.8%. And if individuals have had multiple surgical procedures and latex gloves have been used intraoperatively, there's a 6.5% prevalence of latex allergy. We don't know about this Ebola outbreak in Africa where individuals had to use a lot of protective gear, but the incidence of latex allergy may be increasing in this group of people. Next slide, please. Sensitization to latex occurs through five separate areas. You can inhale the particulate matter. You can have mucous membrane contact, or it can be through peritoneal surface contact. Or if somebody has constantly abraded skin and they are atopic, they can become sensitized. Intravenous administration through latex ports can result in sensitization to latex. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at latex products in the medical setting, there is no FD, there is an FDA mandate to label some of the products in the setting. However, if you go into an operating room, wheels on carts are not labeled as having latex in them, and some items are not adequately labeled, but many medical products in the operating room setting are now labeled. Our next slide talks about products. Next slide, please. Our next slide talks about products in the home setting. And this is where there's a hidden risk for patients who are latex allergic. And if you look at this list, you can see bandages, balloons, condoms, erasers, hot water bottles, pacifiers, teethers, rubber, to rubber toys, sanitary and incontinence pads, which are frequently not thought of by patients in the community to have latex, buttons and electronic equipment, your rubber grips on rackets, bikes, tools, rubber gloves used to wash dishes, baby nipples, carpet bracketing, and in pediatric patients, shoes, those rubber shoes that are available can be a problem. 
rubber clothing, rain gear, and disposable diapers. And this is just uh, to name a few. Now, occupations where latex is used and frequently not thought of as a problem is not just in the healthcare worker setting, but frequently you can go into a restaurant and food handlers and restaurant workers are using latex gloves to prepare food. This puts patients and the healthcare work, the food handler at risk because the latex gloves, when it handles food, there's a fingerprint on the food, and if somebody's a latex allergic and ingests that food, they're going to have an allergic reaction. Other areas where latex gloves do not need to be used are hairdressers, security personnel, construction workers, greenhouse workers, florists, funeral home directors, actors, models, toll collectors, rubber and plantation workers. Now, there is a pattern of cross reactivity between latex and foods. And if you look at this particular slide, if someone is latex allergic, they have a 35% risk to be allergic to one of the foods that's cross-reactive. If they're allergic to the food, they have 11% risk, and the next slide shows those foods. And what we see here is the latex fruit syndrome, or all allergy syndrome, when they eat these foods, their mouth itches. And this is heavy 8 and 12. And just to remember these foods, these are the back fruits, banana, avocado, chestnut, and kiwi. There are other fruits and vegetables that are lower on the list, but these are the most common to cause a reaction. And if you have a patient who reacts to these, you want to consider that they have a potential to develop latex allergy. Now, there are several types of reactions that can occur. Irritant contact dermatitis, a type 1 IgE hypersensitivity reaction, or a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Now, irritant contact dermatitis is not a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. What irritant contact dermatitis is, it's just as if you wear the gloves and your hands are wet, you keep putting the gloves on and taking them off, and your hands become irritated. It's similar to a baby in a wet diaper. Our next slide talks about the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, and that's IgE-mediated, and it can be as simple as hives occurring directly under the glove, Swallow of the lip after you blow up a balloon, or let's say you touch that latex glove to your face, um, you can have, transmit the latex protein to the face and develop a hive there. You can have runny nose, sneezing, and a headache after entering an area where latex gloves are used, padded latex gloves, red and itchy watery eyes, sore throat, hoarse voice, abdominal cramping, chest tightness, reason, shortness of breath, or the dead, dreaded anaphylaxis, which can occur through exposure to the latex. And it's the dip latex products that cause the greatest amount of problem here. Now, patients who have a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, that's a delayed type re reaction. It's contact dermatitis. It's a T-cell mediated response. After using a rubber product on your skin within 48 to 96 hours after exposure, you develop a skin reaction. And that's usually to the processing chemicals used in natural rubber latex, such as thioram, mercaptor benzothiazole, carbonates, and antioxidants such as phenylendiamine. And phenylendiamine is also used in hair dyes, and it's a coloring agent. So if you have black uh, rubber gloves, that could be an issue. So it's localized to the area of contact. It is not beyond the area of contact. Unlike the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, the patient reacts under the glove but can react in remote areas where the glove touches with the hive. The next slide, please. Now, how do we diagnose latex allergy? Well, if you have a patient who experienced these symptoms of an allergic reaction, a skin rash, hives, eyes, tearing, wheezing, itching, difficulty breathing, when exposed to a latex material or a natural rubber product, or he works in some of those settings I mentioned and you're unclear, you want to go back and ask specific questions to ask if they have exposure to latex. So our next question, our next slide, please. Um, talks about the fact that the most important thing we do is history, history, history. And if you go on the American Latex Allergies website, they have a wonderful questionnaire that you could administer to your patient. And you can ask them, what is your workplace association? Are you a healthcare worker? Do you use latex gloves at work? Are they powdered or are they non-powdered? Are you, uh, when you blow up a balloon, do your lips swell? 
when you went to the dentist and he worked on you, did your lips swell and he used a rubber dam in your mouth? What about when you go to the gynecologist or you have intercourse and the condom is used? Do you have symptoms with banana, avocado, or kiwi? Does your mouth itch? Does it swell? And then you want to look at the fact that symptoms may progress. The patient may have contact dermatitis, then develop urticaria, then go on to develop asthma, or the rhinitis type symptoms, and then progress to anaphylaxis. So if there's a history of atopia or unexplained anaphylaxis, you want to ask whether there's been latex exposure. Now, as far as diagnosis, there is no specific skin test in the United States. There is none available. They're only available in Canada and in Europe. Reason being is that the skin test that was developed in the U.S. only tested for hep B6 and didn't cover the other have allergens that are specific IgE uh, reactors. And if we want to evaluate, we can do a confirmatory blood test, which is specific for IgE, but it's not always 100%. So you can do the confirmatory ELISA, you can do the specific IgE, the immunocap, but its sensitivity is 73 to 92% and its specificity is 73 to 97%. There is a test that is going to come out, which is a component test, which will cover the eight allergens that are really significant for patients who are latex allergic, but this is not yet available, but it is in the process of being studied. Patch testing would be done for the patients who develop contact dermatitis and will be helpful to figure out which chemicals are triggering the problem. Now, if we've diagnosed that the patient is allergic to latex, then our key is to avoid powdered latex gloves. We want to use low-protein powder-free gloves in the area where they're working or avoid latex gloves in their area if at all possible and have this person work in an area where there is no latex glove exposure. The patient should carry an emergency kit with epinephrine. And we, she, she or she should be educated about the hidden sources of latex and wear a medical alert bracelet. Our next slide. So how to, what to avoid? The natural rubber latex gloves in the home and gardening, balloons, condoms, diaphragms, lactiferous plants with Christmas coming, your poinsettia. Cross-reactive foods, especially if bananas, avocado, chestnuts, and kiwis have caused problems. Hidden transfer on food prepared with latex gloves. I was at a meeting, and one of my co-workers was served food and did not realize it was made with uh, latex gloves, and she developed a reaction within that setting. So I always ask questions, how is the food prepared? And it should not, latex gloves should not be used where no body fluid is uh, going to be present. If you look at this slide, this shows you a nurse who worked for me had extensions applied to her hair and she said she was sick every day and couldn't really eat any fruits and vegetables and she felt she was going to pass out. She had extensions applied with latex glue. So if you have somebody come in with hair extensions and they're not feeling well, ask that question. Halloween is coming up. The atrical makeup is applied with liquid latex. Keep that in mind. And waxing products in salons may be a problem. Our next slide. 50% of all reactions caused by natural latex rubber are accounted by obstetrical and gynecological procedures. So keep in mind, most of your patients are women. FDA mandate, none for hairdressers or spas or over-the-counter medicines or yoga mats. Everybody's into sports and exercise. So exercise equipment, yoga mats, and bands are a problem. Now here's where we really have to be careful. A lot of injectable medications are risk for latex allergic patients. There is no FDA mandate that they must be labeled. Vaccines, antibiotics, and anticoagulant flushes may have rubber stoppers, bunches, or caps, or the syringes themselves may have a rubber uh, parting. Packaging of products, also in the healthcare setting, me medications and sterile equipment may be wrapped in packages that contain latex. Flu vaccines, and this is a flu season, check with the w with the website from the latex allergy group to find all the vaccines that are latex free. So what do we do? Uh, Dr. Hamilton and his group in American Journal of Health Systems and Pharmacology looked at the rubber stopper to see what degree of exposure. And they did multiple needle sticks through the rubber bungee. And they found that the longer the time, number of sticks, they did one to 40, the greater the amount of latex protein. They skin tested patients who were latex allergic and they were positive to the solution when it came out of that rubber, that's that bottle that had the rubber bungee. 
So in picking our patients, John Kelso in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, if we're going to give them a vaccine, we want to weigh the risk-benefit ratio in the vaccine. If it has latex in it, to be utilized in the latex anaphylactic patient. So our next slide talks to that. What can you do? There's some precautionary measures. You can pop the rubber stopper. You only do one stick through the stopper because there's less of a risk. You use medications that do not contain latex. Go to the American Latex um, Allergy Association's website for the list of the vaccines. Use a glass syringe. Don't wear latex gloves. And observe the patient, even if you go through the stopper once for 15 to minutes to two hours. I would prefer two hours. Also avoid any products that say this product contains natural rubber latex. Now, how to avoid a reaction? Education, education, education. Doctors have to know that this is still a real problem. Wear medical alert identification. Carry an EpiPen. Um, first aid kit. And your car should have latex gloves, the antihistamine, and the epinephrine. Notify all of your healthcare providers, your dentist, your doctors. Notify your friends, your school, and your daycare center, and your employer that you're allergic to latex. Now remember, latex and vaccine packaging. Avoid vaccines in vials and syringes with natural rubber latex. Avoid product does not state not made with natural latex. Weigh benefit versus risk and be prepared to treat a reaction. Next slide. Contact dermatitis. If the patient has contact dermatitis to latex, that type 4 reaction, it is safe to administer the vaccine to this group of patients. So precautionary measures, just to repeat, pop the top of the latex stopper. Latex proteins plus contaminated medication. Keep in mind, the longer the vial has been around with the latex stopper in contact with the solution, the greater amount of contamination. Always a one stick through, wheel, wheel through the vial but it's not 100% to minimize contamination. And always call the manufacturer to ask if there is a latex stopper if it's not labeled. So keep in mind, latex allergy is not uncommon. Three million people in the US. It's a serious healthcare problem. We want to establish the diagnosis. It can be challenging because there's no skin test and you need to use the immunocap. Latex skin test, as I mentioned, not available in the US. And the latex IgE is not perfect. It's the history is positive. Latex exposure resulted in lip swelling, anaphylaxis, urticaria, respiratory difficulty. Avoid, avoid, avoid. And there's lack of FDA mandates on many products. So you always have to call and check, especially those yoga mats. You'll be surprised how many have latex. Pre-medication does not prevent a reaction. So giving patients medicine before exposure, they're still going to react and remind the patient about cross-reacting foods and always be prepared not only to educate the patient, their families, and all the other people. And here are choices of areas where you can get additional education material about latex allergy. And I thank you. Wow, Dr. Gotchek, that's a lot of fabulous information. And uh, we thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us tonight. So next up, we'll have Pat, and Pat's going to speak to us about living with latex allergy. Thank you, and thank you for including me and for highlighting this common issue in spina bifida. As October is spina bifida awareness month, it's a particularly welcome feature. Um, if you have any questions, I'm just going to remind you to type them in, and we'll get to them at the end. So just basically, what is spina bifida? It's the most common permanently disabling birth defect. It's a neural tube defect that happens in the first month of pregnancy, so before you even know you're pregnant, it's already a done deal, and it results in the spinal column incompletely closing. Now, many people are unaware that there are multiple names for spina bifida. In fact, I ran into a resident in the hospital one time who told me, well, that patient doesn't have spina bifida, that patient has myelomeningocele, same thing. So myelomeningocele, myelodysplasia, they're both neural tube defects. It could be a lipomeningocele where there's a fatty inclusion but still affects the formation of the spinal cord. Or it could be a diastatomatomyelia, which is a split cord. Just to give you some historical background on spina bifida and the latex allergy, and I just want to highlight here that many plants have latex but the one that we're concerned about is the natural rubber latex allergy, as Dr. Goshek mentioned. 
Um, so historically, in the 1980s, was really the advent of universal precautions. So universal, universal precautions is an approach to infection control to treat all human blood and certain human body fluids as if they were known to be infectious with blood-borne pathogens. So suddenly we were all wearing gloves in the medical uh, um, cases more often than we were before. So now we're introducing latex very commonly into care of patients. And latex is the cheapest form of gloves, so that's why it's so commonly used. It was 1989 when initial reports of reactions in children with spina bifida came out. Um, and in 1990, one report suggested that there was a 500-fold increase of life-threatening events in surgery for spina bifida. Thankfully, the detectives at work quickly found out that this was related to a latex allergy. In 1991, um, the FDA issued a medical alert and some elective surgeries were postponed as we tried to make our environments more latex free. And it wasn't until 1992 that the CDC actually called an international meeting to address the latex allergy issue. And in 1998 is when the FDA began to require labeling of medical devices containing latex. But as Dr. Goshik said, don't be complacent because you think it should be labeled. I can give you the example of in our clinic, in our wound cart, we would keep a common dressing called Telfa pads. And sure, the, you won't expect there to be latex in a simple Telfa pad, but it's very clearly marked on the package. This packaging contains latex. So it uses like a gummy latex backing to hold the package together. So don't, um, don't become complacent about it. Next slide. So why is the scientific population at risk? Well, this population has early and repeated exposures. So they have surgeries as newborns, prolonged hospitalization, multiple hospitalizations, multiple surgeries. And we know that the protein in latex that is the culprit that can cause the um, allergy is water soluble. So we often are working in a wet environment. These patients are on bladder and bowel programs. And we also see that because they're exposed so often, they were often exposed to the latex proteins through inhalation. Um, there's a, there's, there was just a widespread distribution of latex products and high volume use. So latex is found in over 40,000 products. And again, it, they're not always labeled as containing latex. So as Dr. Gashik mentioned, there are others who are at risk, surgeons and OR staff, um, EMTs, emergency department staff, certainly rubber industry workers, dentists and dental hygienists, food service workers, and in particular those with history of other allergies, eczema, or asthma. So there's no doubt that increased exposure increases the risk. The first case was really reported in 1979, and a few years later there were more than 50 cases reported in the European literature, and now there are several million cases worldwide. So again, we need to really be concerned about our exposure. Dr. Goshak highlighted the latex allergy issue very thoroughly, but I just wanted to remind you that, as she said, the diagnosis is very much based on history. Your history is so important. So latex allergic patients have an IgE directed against specific latex proteins. A RAS test can be done, but it's there is the potential in those RAS tests for a false negative. So we don't want you to rely strictly on that. In fact, as many as one in four have false negatives. So again, you just really have to rely on the history. Next slide. So there are three types of reactions, as Dr. Gashik mentioned, and I'm just going to review them again um, in a bit more detail. But before I do that, I want to remind you that exposure to latex can be through the skin, it can be through mucous membranes, including eyes, mouth, vagina, rectum, 
It can be inhalation from airborne particles, and we often see that with balloons and rubber gloves, which contain a particle that can be airborne and can be inhaled. And of course, we see it through um, blood or direct contact as well. So let's start by talking a little bit about recognizing a reaction. The irritant contact dermatitis is a red, itchy, irritated area on the skin. So it breaks out where latex has touched your skin. It can appear in 12 to 24 hours after contact. It's not an actual allergy, but can be an early warning sign that a latex allergy may develop later. I'll give you an example. I had a little um, girl in clinic, and this was over the Christmas holidays when um, we were getting a lot of donations of gifts, and we were trying to be very, very diligent about screening those gifts that were brought in to be sure that they were latex-free. Um, but one little girl, uh, the mother called me and said, you know, she's got this red, bumpy rash all around her lips, and it seems to be really itchy. And I said, what toy did she pick up yesterday in the clinic? And it was a little doll that probably had a rubber face or latex proteins on the face. And so obviously that doll was removed from her, and we watched that young lady very carefully for the development of the latex allergy. Next slide. So a type 4 reaction is one where there's um, a contact dermatitis that develops. Again, this can have a delayed onset of 12 to 48 hours, um, and it has the patients that have this have a greater potential for developing a type 1 allergic reaction. Let's jump to the next slide. So recognizing a type 1 reaction is so critical. It's an immediate reaction that comes when contact is made, and remember that contact can be skin, mucous membranes, blood, or airborne. Um, it occurs systemically, and it's precipitated by those latex proteins. And I think it's real important to remember that every year latex allergy causes 220 cases of anaphylaxis and three deaths. That's just one statistic that I found in the literature. So what are the symptoms? And I want you to like underline these in red. You know, red watery eyes or itchy eyes, it doesn't have to be all of these. It can be one, and it can progress. Rash, hives, or red blotchy skin, a raspy voice, coughing spells, sneezing, sniffling, wheezing, shortness of breath, dizziness, progresses to nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and changes in blood pressure, which can progress the shock. Now, once you start down this path, it's pretty hard to stop the train from leaving the station. We had a patient in clinic who actually reacted not to latex, but to a topical um, antibiotic cream that we were using. And he went from 0 to 90 so, so fast. And it's the same if you have a latex allergy. It can go, it can move really, really fast. So how do you manage it? Well, first you remove the latex item. Identify what it was you think had latex in it remove the item or remove the person from the area. If it's a mild reaction, you give Benadryl. It's a quick-acting antihistamine. If you're taking it orally, it could take 15 to 20 minutes for it to start to work. To work. But a mild reaction, including redness, rash, itch, rash, itching, swelling of the eyes, I would all use Benadryl. If it's a more severe reaction, hopefully you have an EpiPen. You call 911 for any difficulty breathing, wheezing, or any suspicion of involvement. For my patients that were very atopic or hyperallergenic, I would ask them to carry Benadryl and an EpiPen. That way they'd have the immediate coverage of the epinephrine, but the Benadryl would be kicking in as the epinephrine wore off to cover any lingering reaction. Now we can go to the next slide. Um, let's talk just a little bit about some of the common items that you find in the home. You know, balloons are the biggest culprit, home and at the school, actually. So if your child or you're a person that has a latex allergy, um, you can ask when you're going to parties that there not be balloons. You can ask your school to set a rule that only mylar balloons be allowed. But you also need to be just so diligent. If you're expecting a baby with spina bifida, if you have a baby with spina bifida, put that notice out in your baby shower. 
invite that everything should be latex free. Um, look at koosh balls, pacifiers, nipples, dolls, balls, band-aids. Um, even liquid applique on t-shirts can have latex in it. Chewing gum, toothbrushes, handles of tools. We try to update our list at the Spina Bifida Association every year looking at culprits or those items which are suspected or commonly have latex and give another column that offers safe alternatives. So I've included the link there to the Spina Bifida Association for you. In the community, um, common items at school, pencil erasers or pen and pencil grips. You know, I didn't even think of pen grips until I walked into the clinic one day and one of my patients said, is that a latex-free pen? And I went, oh my gosh, I don't know. So it's important to think about those common things that you know, you're used to handling every day um, that may be of concern for your patients. Crayons. We get crayons donated all the time where you go to a restaurant and they hand you a little pack of crayons. If they're from China, there's a good chance that they might have some latex in them. So be very careful about what crayons the children are using. Rubber bands have latex in them. Bowling balls, condoms, gym mats. All those um, are listed both at the Spina Bifida Association but also at the Latex Allergy Resources. Um, has another very detailed list as well. Remember as you're thinking about products, if they're soft and stretchy, they're going to be more likely to shed the latex protein than if they're hard objects which are less likely to shed the protein. But you still need to be cautious and diligent. Dr. Goshek mentioned the cross-reactivity of foods and allergies. So 35% of those who have a latex allergy react to at least one food. And the reaction doesn't have to be a classic allergic reaction. It could be nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, or bloating. So if you have reacted to a food and you don't know that you have a, a latex allergy, remember from her slide, 11% of those patients potentially have latex allergy. So these are highly suspicious or have a higher cross-reactivity, banana, avocado, chestnut, and kiwi. We had one of our operating room nurses was sitting eating lunch um, one day and she was having a kiwi and all of a sudden her face started to get very blotchy and she said, I don't feel good you guys, I feel kind of like nauseous and her friends looked at her and went, oh my god, you're having a reaction to something. And over the repeated exposures, she was a, um, a seasoned nurse, shall we say, so she probably was in that group that used a lot of latex prior to us going latex free. Um, moderate cross reactivity with apple, carrot, celery, papayas, raw potatoes, tomatoes, and melons. When we did the national conference for Spina Bifida Association here in Bloomington, we actually met with the hotel workers, both the chefs in the kitchen and, and other hotel workers, to talk to them about making the hotel environment latex free, including um, the menus for the time that we were there. Next slide. So can you avoid developing a latex allergy if you have spina bifida? Well, this study which was done in um, Hamburg is, was really interesting to me because the subjects, they looked at newborns and measured IgE levels in the cord blood. But they matched for sex, gestational age, weight, parental allergy profile, the number of prenatal examinations, and even the, the parents' utilization of latex tools during um, pregnancy. And although the results were higher, they weren't significantly increased, but it still suggests that spina bifida patients are inherently at greater risk. So what does that mean? Next slide. Um, you really need to think about avoiding latex. I was looking on the Spina Bifida Facebook page just to see, I like to see what people are talking about in the community. And someone had said, I've never had a latex reaction, I've never avoided latex. Doesn't mean you still can't develop a reaction. It doesn't mean that you still can't go on to develop an allergy. The more you're exposed, the more likely it is that you will develop the allergy. 
So overall, our avoidance has made a significant difference. But again, if you have spina bifida, you're still at risk. You need to look at observing latex precautions throughout the lifespan. Adult onset of the allergy is a reality. You need to educate children to be their own advocates, starting with those early safety lessons, don't talk to strangers, don't touch latex, and start early and use that throughout their early years to get them used to avoiding latex. Always, always, always check the label. So even if a product is on the safe list, it still could have latex in it. I'll give you an example. We had a patient who was in the hematology clinic getting a central line dressing change who suddenly had an allergic reaction. Well, that central line dressing kit actually had latex products in it. It had latex gloves in it. So although the kit wasn't labeled as such, the gloves, when they went back and looked, actually were labeled. So don't become complacent. Always be vigilant that this is a risk. So in the spina bifida community, there's a number of things that we continue to talk about, like should there be routine screening of IgE levels? Some clinics do it routinely. Um, most clinics rely on history and just say, if you have spina bifida, you need to be in a latex safe environment. Avoid latex as much as possible. Um, should latex gloves be banned? There are many other options, but there are some surgeons who prefer, due to the increased tactile property of latex, they insist on still using latex gloves. If they're operating on a child with spina bifida, there will be no latex in that operating room. Um, we are working on guidelines for the healthcare of individuals with spina bifida. Um, the old guidelines are about 10 years old, so watch the Spina Bifida Association for updates related to that. We're hoping that it will be out um, next summer. Thank and you. I'll turn it over to Sally. Well, thank you so much, Pat. That's such great information. Although I do kind of feel like my face is itching now after listening to all of that. <laughs> But next we're going to turn to school concerns and, and talk about latex allergy in the school setting. Uh, the, it's important to consider uh, the school safety guidelines. And the American Latex Allergy Association has had a fabulous school ma manual that I know is going to be uh, updated and revised soon. But uh, I want to talk to you about the, the three big things that they say is a shared responsibility between home and school is to educate school personnel identify potential exposure, and have an emergency protocol. So just to expand on those slightly, uh, you want to make sure you're identifying, when you're thinking about the education, you want to identify students and staff who have a latex allergy. You want to make sure that you alert staff in a confidential manner because children have a right to having their health information be as confidential as they and their parents want it to be, but also student needs full access to their educational program. So you want to make sure you're balancing need to know of telling people about a latex allergy, but then also making sure that child is never excluded. You want to talk about latex-free alternatives, and that's both medical equipment used in the health office, but also school supplies. You want to think about gloves, curricular items, and you want to think about that classroom environment. And you want to make sure you educate your staff, make sure they know what latex allergy is, what it looks like, and all those related issues we've been talking about. So when you want to identify potential exposures, again, you want to make sure you're doing preventative work. And again, you know, you're going to hear some some uh, things that are similar to what Dr. Gotchek and Pat had to say, but that's what's so important to keep in mind. In the classrooms, you want to get rid of those erasers and the rubber bands. And another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of art and science equipment can be made with latex. In the cafeteria, you want to make sure you're, you're using latex-free gloves and being very aware of those cross-reactive foods. That was something that uh, it was quite a few years into my school nursing career that I found out about the cross-reactive foods. But that's something we should always have in the back of our head, that if a child comes in and they've had some one of these foods and they seem to be developing an allergic reaction, that that should be something that tips the school nurse off, that there could be a, a latex allergy at play. 
So make sure that foods with those um, cross-reactive foods in them should be clearly labeled or they should be removed from the menu if you have a child with a latex allergy. I think the gym and the playground are probably like landmine fields for these poor kids with the latex allergies because of the rubber mats, the balls, the flooring, and the racket handles. So, you know, we want to make sure we're taking good care of every child and making sure those are latex free. You're going to want to talk to your custodian about using latex free gloves and products. And the nurse's office, think about latex-free gloves and equipment. You know, most stethoscopes are latex-free now, but be sure that you're not using an older one that may have latex in it. And when developing an emergency protocol, you want to think about specific plans for recognizing and treating any allergic reaction, but specifically a latex allergy as well. So uh, you just want to make sure that you have latex-free first aid supplies and also any student that has a diagnosed latex allergy and is at risk for anaphylaxis should have an emergency care plan. So basically, um, you want to help make sure, too, that students are learning to manage their own allergies. Uh, they, this is something I think school nurses are so committed to helping students really be able to take care of themselves out in the real world. So you want to make sure they're wearing medical alert identification. I know that's kind of a challenge in middle school and high school, but nonetheless, it's incredibly important. Uh, and then make sure they always carry epinephrine. Uh, any child at risk for anaphylaxis should have their epinephrine with them whenever it's developmentally appropriate. And we were just at our uh, U.S. Anaphylaxis Summits with the Allergy and Asthma Network, and we had a great presentation by some emergency room physicians. And they said the most important thing to think is epinephrine first, epinephrine fast. And so you really want to have that be your mantra. I, I worked with an allergist in Rochester, New York, and he used to always say, if you think to yourself, gee, I wonder if I should use the, and epinephrine's the next word, go ahead and give the epinephrine and don't even finish the sentence. Uh, children need to learn to tell people about their allergy to help them avoid exposures. And it's very important to talk to your allergist about any issues that you're having and learning management skills. So I talked to Sue Lockwood of the American Allergy, American Latex Allergy Association, and I asked her for three of her most frequently asked questions about latex allergy at school. And the first one she told me about was a lot of people want to know, how do I keep my child safe at school? So I, I think it's important to follow those guidelines we just talked about. And I think it's also so important to establish really good communication between the home school and the medical home. And this is all about building bridges. Uh, you know, parents of students with an allergy, they're, they're, they worry about their child 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the more sensitive that we can be at school to talking to them about how can we manage things instead of saying we can't do that, that's a very important thing. We're going to want to make the environment as safe as possible. Prevention is key, but we also always have to be prepared in the event that there is an emergency. The next question she gave me was, how do we work to be sure everyone understands what my child needs? And again, communication is key. Uh, the school nurse is obviously the leader in the school setting on making sure children are safe. And uh, the other thing uh, parents can request is a 504 plan when it's needed to make sure a child gets needed accommodations. Most schools have a 504 coordinator, and that's the appropriate person to talk with. A school administrator or the school nurse can help facilitate that procedure. But again, make sure that the faculty is educated. If, if I had a student with latex allergy, I would take some of the great latex information that's out there. And not only would I post it in the faculty room and possibly in the classroom, but I would ask for time at a faculty meeting to talk about it with the whole faculty as well. Because students do not stay in one room in one little spot. They're all over the school and everyone needs to be invested in caring for these kids. And then the question is, how do we get the school to ban latex balloons? And I think education is just huge. 
there is often a lot of pushback when we ask parents to uh, omit something in the school environment for an allergic student. But, uh, but that could be included in the 504 plan because that is legally binding. And if we could certainly have it in there, that would give parents some more um, ammunition if needed. But promote the use of Mylar balloons. Those are not going to be a problem for a child with a latex allergy. We want to make sure there's signage at school, maybe like a no balloon zone or something. You know, keep it light, but make sure people know that, that latex balloons are not welcome at school. And then simply being vigilant, uh, making sure Pat uh, emphasized this as well, always being on top of, of the issue. And I think it's really important to just emphasize building bridges between home and school. Uh, this isn't an allergy that most schools are used to dealing with. But if you hit roadblocks, you can call the American Latex Allergy Association or the Allergy and Asthma Network, and we can work with you. But make sure you just impress upon school administration just how serious this is, but how manageable it is with the appropriate accommodations. So at this point, we're going to open things up to some questions. And, uh, and we have a few. So our first question is, my child has spina bifida and we avoid all natural rubber products, especially medical products and surgeries, but we have never had a reaction. Do we need to continue precautions of avoiding products or should we carry Epi? Dr. Gotcha, could you take that question? Um, I would say yes, you should continue to avoid because um, the spina bifida patient is at greater risk of exposure and developing a reaction uh, to latex at some time in the future. I would always be prepared in this case. And I would ask Pat what her input is on this because she's had a lot of experience in her clinic. But my experience with patients like this are that they should continue to avoid, they should not be exposed to latex, and they should carry uh, their EpiPen just in case. So I would agree that um, you need to continue to limit the exposure. We usually did not prescribe EpiPens unless there was some reaction. So if there's a history of any reaction, then yes, um, an EpiPen should be carried. But until there's a reaction, I wouldn't go there. Okay, so if you're thinking sensitivity, you want to think Benadryl. But if you're thinking an allergic reaction, then definitely epinephrine. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, I, have, uh, I have a problem with that because um, I feel that a lot of the lay public doesn't know the difference between a serious allergic reaction until you train them. So somebody may assume that, you know, uh, generalized hives is just a local reaction and they'll use Benadryl and the reaction will progress quite quickly to anaphylaxis. So, um, you know, if it's one hive, but if it's generalized systemic urticaria, I think that they need to have the EpiPen. Okay, well, so, Dr. whatever other questions that, that lead here is, could, couldn't the Benadryl mask a continuing reaction? Possibly, yes. So, Dr. Do you think everybody with spina bifida should carry an EpiPen? Well, no, but I don't know. The, the, doctor, the person who asked the question uh, was a patient, and she did not say her child had symptoms. So she asked, should she still carry the EpiPen? She's never had a reaction to the uh, latex, but she didn't mention whether the child had had a reaction to fruits or anything else or had an allergy history. So you know, I don't want to give medical advice to someone that I don't know the whole history to. Correct. That's where I was concerned, and that's why I said I would still carry the epi, but she has to talk to her physician, and if her physician provided it, why did he provide it? Did she feel, did he see that there was some other signs that the patient was at risk for a reaction? And without knowing the whole history, and it's just one simple question, she, I, I basically, basically just, I have to look at that question again, but I think my child is fine a bit for them, we do all natural latex products, and um, but do we need to continue to carry um, and continue precautions? So I don't know if this child had a reaction to foods or any other reaction, and that's why they have the epi. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So I wouldn't give an epi if there's no reaction, but I don't know what the case is here. Yeah. 
Well, and I think you've certainly made the point well of history, history, history uh, earlier in the presentation. And and it does sound like, like that's just so incredibly important to look at that experience and, and what that child's uh, issues have been in the, you know, previously. I, I've got another question for Dr. Gotchak. Is there a guideline for latex allergy for uh, MDs to follow, like diagnosis and testing and patch testing for accelerators? So you know if you are allergic to natural rubber, natural rubber latex or synthetic latex products. Um, but here's the problem. There's no specific guideline that has been put out by our organizations who are working on them. However, the American Latex Allergy Association has a terrific questionnaire that you can give to your patients that will help you in um, leading you to the diagnosis. Um, when you look at the literature that's available, you can do your immunocap testing, but that if that's negative, then um, if the history is positive, it means the patient is allergic. So you, you, if you look at the latex allergy diagnostic questionnaire, that would be helpful. As far as the contact dermatitis, there is a, a company that makes a product called the True Test, T-R-U-E. And that true test is a means to test for immunity agents that are in the gloves. The problem is if you're going to use different pro vinyl products that you want to test to, you're going to have to test, call the manufacturer to find out what agents are added to that glove in the manufacturing process to know what to test to. So your true test has the basic um, mercaptobenzothiazole, the thiamines, the phenylendiamines, the carbonates. However, if you have an outlier, which is a product which comes from another company, you might want to contact the company and find out what agents are using that glove, and then you could obtain patch testing material to do it. But there's not a specific guideline as far as which patch testing to go to do. We know which agents are added, but there are over 200 different chemicals that can be added to a latex product, which makes it quite difficult. So you have to do the standard test, see what comes up positive, but if it's an outlier vinyl glove or one of the non-latex gloves, then you have to get back to the manufacturer to find out what's in that glove and in the manufacturing process. Thank you so much. Well, we're almost done with our time this evening. Dr. Gotchek and Pat, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This topic, I think we could talk for about another three hours on it. There's so much, so many concerns uh, to be considering. But thank you again for being with us. Um, I'd like to encourage our listeners to join us for our November webinar, which is titled Severe Asthma, Evaluation Management, and New Advances. It will be presented by Dr. Bradley Chips on November 11th at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Please watch for registration on our website. It, our web address is www.allergyasthmanetwork.org. Click on Education and then Webinars to register and also find our recorded webinars. In December, we'll be exploring smoking and asthma with Dr. Michael Blaze. Our webinar series helps the Allergy and Asthma Network live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. So as we conclude today, please access our Allergy and Asthma Network's website for valuable information. We have sections designed specifically for patients, and for healthcare professionals. This webinar will be posted this week in the education section of our website. Again, look for the education page and click on webinars. On behalf of the staff of the Allergy and Asthma Network, this is Sally Schessler, Director of Education. Thanks for joining us today.